Hey, uh, we're going to start this week again with uh, some Name That Tunes. And uh, so get your notes out there and get ready to go. Uh, I have uh, received a couple requests uh, from people. They say if I give them a little bit more time um, to sing through the song, um, that they might actually get to the answer or have more time to Google it to, right? So I'm kind of torn. Which way do I go here? Do I... Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit more time, but not enough time to, well, you can Google probably faster than I can speak it. So here, anyway, we go. First, name that tune song from A Christmas Carol. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Second song. Sing, choirs of angels, sing in exaltation. Third, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. And finally, fourth, peace on the earth, goodwill to men, from heaven's all gracious king. This one might be a little tougher. All right, here we go. First one. This is uh, what color is Colonel Gray's white horse question. <laughs> what child is this? <laughs> right there. Who laid to rest? Hope you all got that one right. Anybody? <laughs> I, I wanted to give you one good shot, all right? Second one. Sing choirs of angels. Sing in exultation. O come all ye faithful, or also sometimes people call this, O come let us adore him, from the reprise in the chorus. Who got it? All right. Not everyone. Okay. That's not giving me hope for the rest of these. <laughs> Third, while fields, floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Joy to the world. How many got? All right. A little better there. Joy to the world. <laughs> All right. And finally, um, fourth song, Peace on Earth, Goodwill to Men from Heaven's All Gracious King. You can thank Deb for this one because I was thinking, I was looking for one more last night and she uh, gave me this one. And I actually had to sing through the whole song myself to get to the answer. But I did get there. It came upon a midnight clear. How many got that? Anybody get all four? Anyone? No one? Too bad. I had a new car for anybody who got all four. But since nobody did, here we go. All right. We are in our third week of Advent and uh, walking through um, using uh, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol as kind of a guideline, thinking through Christmas past, present, and not yet. And just a reminder, you know, um, the first week we talked about the spirit of Christmas past. That hundreds of years before Jesus came into the world, there were these promises that God was giving to the prophets. Isaiah chapter 9, for to us a child is born, a son is given. And, and this son that God was given, he was going to create this government, this kingdom. And in that kingdom... He would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, ever, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the greatness of his government and peace, there would be no end. That he was coming to establish a kingdom. That God, what God was doing was bigger than sometimes we imagine. That God was writing a larger story than people anticipated. The, the, the restoration of the kingdom of God over all of creation. And he says, the zeal of the Lord 
would accomplish this, the zeal of the Lord Almighty. But he wouldn't do it with angel armies. We come to the second week of Advent and the spirit of Christmas present, that when God did this reconciling, this establishing of his new, new kingdom, he didn't do it with the mighty force of angels. But Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not require, regard equality with God as something to be exploited emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being made in human likeness, and being found in human appearance. He humbled himself and became obedient. That the way that God was going to accomplish this great work was to humble sacrifice through love. That he came not with an angel army, but with love for your neighbor, to love others as God loved us, to love even our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. That the zeal of the Lord accomplished something amazing through this, not angel army, but through this babe in a manger. And that that babe in a manger would grow up, suffer and die, but, but what he left in the wake would actually topple the Roman Empire, not through violence, but through sacrificial love. And 2,000 years later, we still remember and celebrate that love. We celebrate Jesus' birthday on, on, on Christmas, but reminded that every one of our birthdays is dated from his birth. That it changed the course of history. When Isaac Watts wrote the poem, Joy to the World, he wasn't writing a Christmas carol, although we sing it every Christmas, usually at the end of our Christmas Eve service, that he was pinning a poem with a new understanding of a very old poem from Psalm 98, from the Bible. And that he was reinterpreting this, this old psalm, now this psalm that was, pro, that was prophesying, promising what God was going to do, he's saying this psalm, 98, is now fulfilled in Christ. And joy to the world when he wrote this song, this Christmas carol, was like a Christian-centric or Christ-centric or Christ-fulfilled expression of Psalm 98. And so Psalm 98 says, Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness in the nations. So Isaac Watts writes, Let earth receive her king. What God promised in Psalm 98 is fulfilled in Christ. Receive the king. That is the expression, of the revealing of the righteousness to the nations. Psalm 98, verse 3, He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All of the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. So Isaac Watts writes, He rules the world. All the ends of the earth will see the salvation. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. Psalm 98, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Joy to the world. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. This is the one. This is the Messiah. This is the promise of our deliverance. The psalmist, let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord. Heaven and nature sing. Fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. All of creation celebrates the coming of the King. For he comes to judge the earth. 
He, judged, he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. No more. Let sin and sorrow grow. Right? When you judge all of creation, sin and sorrow are put to rest finally. Nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Joy to the world is an anticipation of the second coming, of the return of Christ, of the fulfillment of all of the promises to the prophets. Not a celebration, first and foremost, of his first coming. And it gives us Psalm 98, the Christmas carol, Joy to the World, give us a vision of the spirit of Christmas not yet. vision, a picture of Christmas that has not yet come. When, as Paul says, creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. If the spirit of Christmas present or Christmas past reminds us that Christ's coming wasn't first and foremost, about rescuing Israel. Nor is it even really about us having ourselves a merry little Christmas. The, the Christmas past was about the kingdom of God and his rule. And if the spirit of Christmas present reminds us that God isn't coming in angel armies, but in humble sacrificial love, the spirit of Christmas past was much bigger than we anticipated. The Christmas present was much smaller than we anticipated. The spirit of Christmas not yet shows us that the end game, what God finally accomplishes through the coming of Christ, is better than we ever imagined. If you believe in the second advent, if you believe that Jesus came and that he is coming again. What is your vision of his return? What's it going to look like when this story has played its course and things are finally as they were meant to be? I think some of our, some of our pictures that, that we're given are, you know, that we're going to be angels getting our wings, like what's his name uh, from It's a Wonderful Life? Clarence, getting our wings, you know, and then what do we do with our wings? I'm going to sit on a cloud and play a harp? Or we talk about entering the pearly gates and the golden streets of heaven. Or we sing about an eternal church service in the sky. When we've been there 10,000 years, we have no less days to sing God's praise. We can just keep singing and 10,000 years, and we're just singing and singing and singing for all the more. Is that the picture? Is that how this story ends? I think we think about seeing and being reunited with the people that, that we love. And that's, I think, a very desirous experience, right? To, to, to be reconnected to the, to the people that have gone before us and, and that, we, that we miss and we, in, our, in our present now, but have this hope of being restored and reconnected to them for all of eternity. Of seeing Jesus face to face and being transformed into his likeness. What do you see when you see this final restoration of the kingdom of God. All of creation has fallen under a curse. That curse, we think about, far as the curse is found, goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden and the first thing that we find in the curse 
is this separation, this breaking of communion with God. The, the choice to pave our own path, to make our own life, to make our own way, separates us, breaks our communion with God who purposed for us to be in communion with him. So the first part of it is like, now instead of walking with God in the cool of the day, Adam and Eve are hiding in the bushes, breaks our communion with God. And then once that communion with God, because he's the source of our identity, we're created in his image and likeness, once that's severed, it broke ourselves, that, that we're no longer integrated whole in our humanity, that our minds and our hearts and our bodies and our souls are broken. And so we suffer from mental illness and physical illness and competing and conflicting interests and desire for things that don't serve us and actually harm us and to pursue fulfillment and things that never deliver we lose our sense of self. It, so it breaks our communion with God. It breaks ourselves. It breaks our relationships with other people. We were created for this shared rule over all of creation. But the curse led to a power struggle, first between Adam and Eve, right? They were given the garden. You're in charge of it. Rule over it. Run this place together. And in the curse... Eve is told that now your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. It was broken. And so if you wonder why we have a gender gap and hashtag me too and all this division and separation and control and manipulation... It's because that's how far the curse goes in our relationships. Created naked and unashamed. And now full of shame. Broken at the very core level of even of our sexuality. Broken. Brother against brother. Think about everything that's wrong in the world. Nations raging against nations. Neighbor raging against nation. The rich exploiting the poor. Brother killing brother. Cities filled with violence. Mass shootings. And it all goes back to this division of our connection to God and our brokenness in ourselves, the issues in brokenness with the world, and it doesn't end there. It broke creation itself. The God's good creation. Everything that he made was good, is now, Paul said, subjected to frustration. He said, fill the earth and subdue it. Take the stuff that I made and make stuff out of it. And fill it with your creativity and the resources that I've given you to do something beautiful. And what would we do? We made weapons of mass destruction. Rule over the birds, the fish, and the animals of the sea. And this good world that God made becomes a killing field. The whole creation... Paul says, has been groaning. It's broken, cursed. And Jesus embodied this curse in the crucifixion. Paul writes, Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law when he was hung on the cross. He took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scripture, cursed is 
everyone who is hung on a tree. That this curse that had been, that the earth had been subjected to, that our relationships with had been subjected to, that our communion with God had been broken by, that Jesus took this curse upon his shoulders and was hung on the cross bearing the weight of and the responsibility of that curse for all of humanity and for all of creation. And when he did that, Jesus broke the curse in the resurrection. So that all these things that had been divided, like when he, when he died on the cross, the veil in the temple was broken. That veil was a symbol of our separation from God. The tearing of that veil says we're no longer separated from God. We have now have access to God again. Paul says that, that in Christ... There is no Jew nor Gentile. This division of the nations and of cultures, Jesus eliminated that. He says there's now no male or female. This brokenness, this ex- exploitation, this manipulation and coercion and control. He says Jesus eliminated that. He broke that wall, that barrier down between slave and free. The things that divide us in our economic worlds and the haves and the have-nots. He says... Jesus eliminated that barrier so that in the early church we see people, Jews and Gentiles coming together in the church and, and male and female worshiping together in churches in, in the church in a way that they never had before. And people who were poverty sickened and slaves being in communion and fellowship with people who had resources and all of them coming together to take care of it. Now, was it perfect yet? No, it wasn't, but it was happening. We had the first fruits of all these barriers falling down. It's what changed the world. Jesus broke the curse. And when he returns in the second advent, he will eradicate the curse at every level. You want to know how far the curse is found? Look at the reverse of the curse. This is what the Bible says happens when it's finally finished. This picture of a new kingdom. I'm going to read through quickly several passages that show us how far this is, the world has fallen and seeing how far it will be restored. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from that throne saying, Look, God's dwelling is now among the people. Separation's gone. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. No more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. No more mourning, death, crying, or pain. All of that is a result of the curse that Jesus has broken and is going to bring to an end. Isaiah chapter 2 says they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. We took the stuff that God made and made weapons out of it. Those weapons are going to be turned into resources to feed and nurture and to care for the world. Isaiah 11, the wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat and the calf and the lion, the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Even the lion and the lamb are now eating together. That's how far the curse has gone. When you watch the National Geographic, the Nature Channel, and you see those, you know, antelopes being chewed up by the lions, right? Done. That was part of the fall, part of the brokenness. When you see my kids playing with a cobra, you know the world has been changed, right? That's how far the curse goes. That's how far the renewal, the restoration goes. It's actually my theology for, that I use for um, pet funerals. Right? If there's a lion and a lamb in heaven, then there's got to be a Peyton and a Dungy, right? 
Zechariah says, On that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the sacred bowls in the front of the altar. Everything in creation that is not a product of the fall will be fully restored so that even the decorations on the horses and the pots and the pans will be sacred, holy to the Lord. Everything to the glory of God. John writes, He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Write this down. These words are trustworthy and true. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. Paul says, in this hope, in this renewal, in this elimination of the curse as far as it's found in all things brilliant, it is in that hope that we were saved. In Hebrews, it says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Sometimes our definition of faith is believing that God exists. But faith is more than believing that God exists. Faith is believing with certainty certainty in everything that the God who exists exists has promised. Being sure of it and hoping for it. The promise of the spirit of Christmas not yet tells us what it will look like when it is fully complete. We cannot hope for what we do not want. And if our vision of the restoration is wings and harps on a cloud or an eternal church service in the sky, right? I think I can imagine a better future for myself than that. But a world where everything has been made new and all that's been stained and tainted by sin and brokenness and the pain of our world is eradicated and everything that's left is to the glory of God. That is something that's worth hoping for. Isaiah says, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. Isaiah says it's more, actually, than we can only imagine. That he's actually given us some pictures of what it looks like. And they're powerful images intended to be a hope that is the very anchor of our soul as we navigate our way through a world that is not yet what it will be. Hope, true hope, a sure hope in a certain future is an anchor says, hey, this Christmas, unless Jesus returns before next Sunday, this Christmas is going to be a beautiful day for many of us and a really, really hard day for other people and some combination of both for all of us. It will not be, unless Jesus returns between now and then, the fulfillment of all of our hopes and dreams. But it will remind us again that God has set in motion the events that will take us to that place, to that time. 
we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. I love it that when Charles Dickens named his spirits, like the spirit of Christmas past, the spirit of Christmas present, to me, my mind goes to, well, the spirit of Christmas future. But he doesn't say that. He, has, he says, the spirit of Christmas not yet. The spirit of Christmas that will be. But it isn't yet. To me, every sentence in your life that has a period at the end of it, that speaks to pain and shame and brokenness and fear and doubt and unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment and anger, sorrow, every sentence in your life that has a period, this is the way it is, this is who I am, this is the way it will always be, this is what happened and it can't be changed, it's gone and it'll never be again. Every sentence that has a period, the spirit of Christmas not yet erases the period and puts a comma and says, but, but it will be. All things made new. The spirit of Christmas present. The spirit of Christmas past is bigger than anyone imagined. The spirit of Christmas present was smaller than anyone imagined, but the spirit of Christmas not yet is better, better than you ever dreamed. The renewal, the restoration of all things. God, fill us with hope this week as we count down to the celebration of Christmas, the celebration of your coming. But deepen our hunger and our thirst for the Christmas that is not yet. And our certainty, our confidence, and our hope that it will be. May every desire that is yet unfulfilled stir a deepening hope inside of us for what is not yet. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.